In the town of Stadtlauringen in Bavaria, Severin and Anastasia Gerschütz took into their home a young, half-Jewish woman named Eva Schmallenbach and her Jewish mother Irene in May 1943. The two changed their hiding places several times during the next few months, but they always returned to the Gerschütz home. The rescuer's youngest son, Hilmar Gerschütz, remembers... The neighbors knew nothing. Neither did our relatives who visited us regularly at home. We couldn't put them in jeopardy. My mother told them they were simply refugees, bombed out. <laughs> she even suggested that Eva could be my brother's future bride. Eva lived in our house, together with her mother, for several months. My parents didn't like the idea of those two trying to escape to Switzerland, but friends of hers told Eva that there was a chance for them to do it. But they were caught by the border police. Eva was brought back to Mainz by the police. Her mother was sent directly to Auschwitz. Eva escaped again and went into hiding in Munich. She certainly didn't stay with us the whole time. Most of the time she was somewhere else. As a young woman, without a job in wartime, it was very difficult for her. She also hid in Berlin and later in Munich. Shortly before the end of the war, my father felt uneasy about her hiding place and asked if she thought she could safely make her way up to us, and if so, that she could come and wait with us till the war was over. And then they caught her near Nuremberg. Those days were terrible for young people like us. It was terrible to be inwardly against your own fatherland and the ruling party. And we certainly knew that in the case of a German victory, we would have been deported to the east. That was clear. In retrospect, I think my parents were absolutely justified in doing what they did. They were convinced anti-Nazis from the very first day. And true to the church, of course. Eva lived through the rest of the war in the Ravensbrück concentration camp in Germany. Her mother died in Auschwitz. In the days following the German conquest of Poland, some Germans reached out to offer assistance to Jews facing certain death. One was Berthold Beitz, a civilian engineer he had been assigned by his company to work in Borislav, Poland. His biographer, Dr. Bernd Schmalhausen, shares with us some highlights of his experiences at the time. Mr. Beitz originally worked for the German shell company in Hamburg. After the war broke out, the oil producing sector was of course very important for German war industry. So experts from the oil producing industry were sent to Borislav. Mr. Beitz became chief administrative officer of the drilling inspection activity in Borislav for the Carpathian Oil Company. He was the chief administrative and finance officer. Among other things, he was responsible for the company's so-called Jewish labor force. It is clear that at first he didn't realize what was happening to the Jews of Borislav. There were only rumors. Officially, the Jews were moved to places for forced labor. That's what Mr. Beitz believed too at first. And only after certain events, for example, what he saw at the Borislav train station, he realized what really was happening to the Jews. There was certainly a crucial experience for him at the train station. He saw small children who were of no use for forced labor being deported. Then it became obvious to him that a murder, a mass murder was planned. While loading people in the boxcars, German soldiers also shot some of the Jews in the street. Mr. Beitz witnessed that. He then realized exactly what was going on. And later, 
He also witnessed mass executions that took place in Borislav itself. Mr. Beitz was able to get a large number of Jews who were about to be deported to the extermination camp in Belzec out of the train cars, stating untruthfully that he needed these skilled workers. And then, again and again, when roundups for further transports took place, he allowed Jews to hide themselves in his office or in his house. He also hid a Jewish child in his house for a longer period of time. Mr. Beitz always plays down his efforts. He explains that he was very young at the time and didn't worry too much. But I'm convinced he realized it was very dangerous. He saw what was happening and was directly involved. Mr. Beitz was in fact arrested twice by the Gestapo for his assistance to the Jews. In 1944, the Russian army liberated the Borislav area. Berthold Beitz had by that time been drafted into the German army. Today he is a highly respected and successful businessman in Germany and the president of the Alfred Krupp von Bohlen and Halbach Foundation. Today Dresden is a city of elegance and restored baroque beauty. By early 1945, however, it was one of the most heavily bombed cities in Germany. In March 1945, the advancing Russian army found the city almost totally destroyed. Earlier that month, Roman Halter, a young Polish-Jewish forced laborer, escaped from a Nazi-organized death march and found himself at the farm of Mr. and Mrs. Fuchs on the outskirts of the city. Mr. Fuchs, who was a uniformed ambulance driver and his wife, accepted Roman's plea to hide in their home. One day I was cycling on my way back home. I opened the door and I stood facing a nice young man just a high school student, who was then 17 years old. I could only imagine that he was one of the Jews from that camp, where 500 Jewish laborers worked. So Roman was here in our little garden. He pretended to be a worker. We owned a piece of land at that time. He cut trees, he dug up the garden, and everything went quite well. Politically, it was very dangerous. You always had to keep silent. You couldn't trust the person next to you. The war became worse and worse. More and more people became victims. And all of us were frightened. We always lived in fear. There wasn't enough food for us, but we couldn't talk about it. We all walked around silently. The persecution of the Jews weighed very heavily upon us, especially upon us Christians. I can see it still today the people with the yellow badge for Jews, the fearful look on their faces, their fear of death. It was a hard life. When the war was over, on May 11, 1945, Roman left us to search for his relatives in Poland. 
in in Polen. And then, in a few weeks, he came back to see how my husband and I were doing. But this dreadful thing had happened. My husband was dead. I was told that he had been killed because he was against the Nazi regime. Members of the Nazi party told me that. They said he was a traitor. They would take him to where he belonged, to the scaffold. Mrs. Fuchs remains today with her memories, near the house and the tree under which she buried her husband. 53 years ago. Honoring these exceptional people is one of the missions of the Holocaust Remembrance Authority, Yad Vashem, based in Jerusalem, Israel. Here, among the trees, are plaques and markers which identify some of the rescuers of Jewish fugitives during the Holocaust period. Here their stories and memories are recorded for us and for future generations to know and to honor. Professor Yehuda Bauer, director of the International Center for Holocaust Studies at Yad Vashem, gives us an impression of the significance of the moral courage shown by these extraordinary people. Yad Vashem has honored some 16,000 rescuers who risked their lives in order to save Jews from the Nazis. Of these, some 300 came from Germany. Now we know that there were thousands more. Of course, we will never know their names. Even if we multiply these by four or five, the number of rescuers will have been infinitesimally small in proportion to all the European populations. Nevertheless, these stories are of tremendous importance for us because they show us that people had a choice between being evil and being good and rescue and save other human lives. The stories that you have seen in this film are stories that did not always end successfully. Many of the rescued were afterwards caught and died. Largely unknown or forgotten, these unique people left their own legacy of moral courage to the otherwise inhuman tenor of German state policy of the time. Perhaps 5,000 Jews were saved by these selfless German rescuers. These were the people who offer us a beacon of light in understanding the true meaning of the brotherhood of mankind. Thank you.